Well, much was hoped last night from this government to finally address some of the major issues and embrace some of the opportunities we have ahead, but I am sad to say it is an opportunity missed. In fact, we are going to be miles behind the rest of the world on this kind of plan from the government. If I could say locally for Warringah, we did see finally, after years of neglect when it comes to infrastructure spend, 75 million towards a much needed upgrade of Wakehurst Parkway, which is scheduled to finish between 20, by 2025. And there are some important extensions to grant programs like Popular Stronger Communities Program, and that will support local organisations with facility upgrades. However, still no progress on Beaches Link Tunnel, major infrastructure required for the Northern Beaches, and also no meaningful funding for the Sydney Harbour Federation Trust. And we are talking about iconic locations at the entrance of Sydney Harbour that are important historically for all of Australia. But what we do know that came out of this budget is that this was a budget for the nationals. This was not a budget for the nation. We now know what it costs to secure the support of the posturing by the government prior to COP26 last year and to commit to net zero. And that cost to the nationals and Barnaby Joyce was in the tune of between 17 and $21 billion. This was the sellout of your children's future. The discrepancy in spend between pork barrelling, targeted spending in electorates because they are marginal, because they want to secure that support, compared to where it is actually needed is just outrageous. It's hard to describe how disappointing this budget is. And when we look at the situation that so many in our communities find themselves at the moment, in particular on the east coast in Lismore, facing a second flood, and only yesterday in question time, the Prime Minister again repeated the fallacy that this is a one in 500 of a year event. Don't you worry. We'll just help you clean up now and you won't face this again. You'll be fine. She'll be right. When in fact they're, me they're having this disaster again some weeks after the first. Within the last 10 years, they have been ravaged by disaster after disaster. And this is a government with its head entirely in the sand, in the past, unable to prepare for the future or to protect our children's future and in any way embrace the opportunities of where the world is heading. So because it is under pressure, with a poll coming in six weeks, we're seeing a measure around the fuel excise to try and help the cost of living, which I acknowledge is incredibly tough. But if we want to address cost of living, we have to address underlying causes. The government has decided to halve the fuel excise over the next six months. So a 22 cent per litre cut is at a cost of over three billion to the budget. There is no long-term vision on addressing transport emissions or fuel security. Because what we're seeing here is that on top of the $2 billion already handed out to oil refineries in last year's budget and the $7.7 .7 billion in fuel tax credits for the fossil fuel industry this year, the fuel excise is approximately 12 times more than what has been given to low emissions vehicle under the government's future fuels fund over just this next six months. Just absolutely nothing. To give you a comparison, $3 billion could support a $3,000 rebate for 1 million electric vehicles or could subsidise the cost of 4 million homes with bus and business charges. No measure, and, and what's worst about this measure is that there is no guarantee it will actually be passed on to consumers. So just as what happens when Reserve Bank lowers interest rates, and you do you, you, more often than not, the big banks don't pass on the full cut to consumers, and it's only a percentage of that lowering that you get. The same is likely to happen here. There are no measures to ensure this cut actually flows to consumers. And it won't do anything to address the long-term exposure to oil prices or the reliance that we have on 90 per cent of our fuel is imported each year. And that costs us $29 billion to consumers. There is nothing in this measure to mitigate long-term threat, volatility and global security challenges of imported oil. 
nothing to reduce emissions. Transport emissions are expected to increase from 90 to 125 million tonnes by 2030, which is eight Hazelwood coal-fired power stations. There is nothing in this budget that accelerates a transition to electric vehicles, but there's over three billion to subsidise, basically, the, the, the fuel industry. Climate Works has modelled that to reach net zero, we need some 76 per cent of new car sales to be electric by 2030. Under this government, we are only projected to get to about 30 per cent, and the current rate is less than 1 per cent. It's a joke. The states are pulling the, their weight. They are trying to move this, but the federal government has its head completely in denial. We need and the, the irony is this measure will do so little to help families with the vehicle running costs in the long term. If by going electric, families can save up to $140 a month of running costs and 10 tonnes of CO2, with home solar and a battery, could be as high as $160 a month. So what we need in Australia is Australian vehicle emission standards. We need to require manufacturers to import vehicles that have low emissions. We need government-funded network of charges for highways, households and businesses. We need upfront rebates for the purchase of electric vehicles and reform to the luxury car tax and fringe benefit taxes. And we need the government fleet to be completely electric by 2023. But there was none of that in the budget last night. Cost of living. We've heard most commentators talk mostly about that. But there's actually nothing in this budget that actually truly addresses cost of living. Whether you like it or not, climate change is the biggest threat to cost of living. All economists agree with that. The biggest threat to the budget bottom line and household cost of living. But it got, and I measured it, 55 seconds from Treasurer Frydenberg in his speech last night out of 35 minutes. It's clear from the Treasurer's words that he has hitched, he has hitched his wagon to the Morrison wagon. He is denier. He is not at all committed to real action on climate change. So it needs to be very clear where people's commitment really is as, as people go to the polls in six weeks' time. At a time where Lismore and Byron Bay's main street is completely underwater, blowing out the cost of households, I mean, I would ask you, is $250 in your pocket in the next few weeks really going to solve the problem for people that are losing their home? for communities that are losing their main street. Businesses are gone. Food prices are already increasing. The disruption from these events is huge. The Global Food Index finds that prices were up 20 per cent on last year already. The cost of house insurance is increasing with many properties becoming uninsurable for natural disasters. And coastal erosion threatens our cities, coastline, including my electorate, with up to half a billion in losses. But is there anything to address that in this budget? No. Cost of natural disasters to the budget bottom line are piling up. Let's get real. Six billion dollars so far for the northern New South Wales, South East Queensland floods this year. 2.8 billion dollars for the black summer bushfires in 2019-2020. 1.5 billion dollars for North Queensland floods in 2019. So do you think in the light of that bigger cost there would be something in the budget that starts building resilience, that we start investing in adapting, in providing some resilience, some measures, some mitigation to keep those communities safe? So in the face of a cost of natural disasters forecast to become $1.2 trillion in cumulative cost over the next 40 years, according to Deloitte, we have a government who allocated $210 million, you heard me right, there aren't any extra zeros on that, for the Australian Climate Service for climate adaptation. And it is planning to cut over the next four years by some 35 per cent the funding to organisations that are primarily responsible for our transitions to low emissions. I mean, it's farcical. It's really hard to describe it in any other terms. And at the same time, despite all the warnings, despite communities being devastated, despite having climate refugees, 
communities that are asking the question, where are we going to go? If our homes are uninsurable, unlivable, who is going to help us relocate? How are we going to rebuild? In the face of that, you would think maybe the answer is let's mitigate the issue and reduce it. No. The answer is let's keep accelerating this transition. Let's accelerate the problem. The government is going to spend $50 million on an acceleration of gas infrastructure and $300 million gas expansion in the Northern Territory. And that is added to the $6.3 billion sweetener for the nationals on three dams, which have no serious business cost, and that are likely to, in fact, flow to coal mining donors and run off and flood and cause more environmental disasters. So if you want to talk about who are the winners and losers in this budget, there is no doubt our kids, future generations, are the losers. They will pay for this mountain of debt that is accumulating and complete failure to invest in our future. To give you some contrast, the $6.3 billion that have been promised to these three dams could cover the cost of 26 weeks of paid parental leave for new parents. It would be a tax rebate of some $3,000 over 2.1 million electric vehicles. Or you could build the equivalent of 11 Northern Beaches hospitals with 5,400 beds. You could cover a year's worth of cheaper childcare. And to put in contrast to that $6.3 billion for three dams, in the face of devastating loss of biodiversity, we know we are the extinction, there's an extinction crisis when it comes to our natural habitats, fauna and flora. $100 million for extension of environmental, the Environmental Restoration Fund. I mean, really. You couldn't have any clearer message from the coalition government. It does not care about the environment. It does not care about the climate. It does not care of the environment in which our children, our society will live. All it's interested in is the next six weeks and how much more money can be pork barrelled into the seats and the fossil fuel industry. The question is always also, what's the alternative? Let me give you a picture of the alternative. At just half of the $21 billion that clearly has been paid to the nationals to placate Barnaby Joyce and get him to sign up to net zero, at just half we could electrify 10 million Australian households. And that would save families $5,000 per year by 2030, delivering $40 billion in savings over the next de decade. It would also cut emissions by 33%. So if we're really having a conversation about reducing the cost of living, let's actually invest in measures that will provide long-term reduction to cost of living. A $5,000 saving is possible if we invest wisely. There's nothing in this budget that addresses a commitment to net zero or long-term cost of living for families. Childcare was another loser. I mean, the tokenistic approach of saying we're investing in childcare by we will build 20 new centres in the region out of 151 electorates, I beg your pardon. I mean, Sam Austin, CEO of Chief Executive Women, said the so-called cost of living budget ignores completely the reality that for many families, early childhood education and care is one of the biggest outgoings in the family budget. There are women who reluctantly say no to extra days work because they simply can't afford the cost of childcare. Pay parental leave changes, oh, they're welcome. I mean, it's tinkering around the edges in getting rid of clear discriminatory policies. But we still haven't increased. We're still one of the lowest OECD parental leave scheme, and it's just so insufficient. It's so disappointing to think that at a time where we have clear warnings of where the priorities need to be, economists are warning inflation, cost of living, wages, and many in this place have made many arguments. But ultimately, all of this is for nothing if we do not address long-term emissions reduction. We need to deliver at least 60 per cent emissions redu reduction by 2030. There is a clear plan to do it. That's the five steps to net zero that I've proposed. We can have a strong new economy, sustainable, circular, but what we do need is vision and leadership, and we don't have that with this government.